Amen. You may be seated. What a privilege it is to sing together, but also to be those who truly do behold the wonder of who the God of the Bible is, and our longing is to get to know Him more and more and more, because the better we know Him, the more we can live life in His presence, confident and filled with love. There is a famous children's story about a chicken who gets struck with an acorn. And they kind of wake up from their concussion. I'll maybe tell it a little differently than you remember. They wake up from their concussion and they look around and they don't know what happened, but they're quite convinced that the sky is falling, that the world is coming to an end. And so they think somehow they can, with their little feet, keep the sky up and they gather their friends around them, group think, and they all struggle to keep the sky in place until they discover the acorn and the sky wasn't really falling. I understand there's another story of that same little chicken playing baseball and getting struck on the head with a baseball and struggling with the same thing. And again, unfortunately, what can sometimes happen even in this world, in the group think of the baseball diamond, everyone again thought the sky was falling and they didn't learn their lesson. Well, the Bible actually tells us that the end is near. And we're not to panic when other things happen around us. In fact, a little study of even the last 50, 60 years will show us the great panics of different generations in thinking the end is near and then responding in ways that don't bring honor and glory to God. In the 1960s, it was the general understanding that in just 10 years, oil would be gone completely and all of the things that we rely on for oil, would be devastated. In the 1970s, it was the global cooling crisis. The Ice Age would happen again in 10 years. In the 1980s, it was acid rain that would destroy all crops, and in 10 years, there would be an incredible famine. The 1990s, the ozone was disappearing and only had about 10 years left. In the year 2000, while you will know about Y2K and the crisis that that was, but they also said that the ice caps will be gone by 2010 and the world will be flooded. Probably none of you will remember this, and I think it was more American than Canadian, but there was the great fear of nuclear war. And so they taught young school children to hide under their desks in case of a nuclear attack from Russia. I'm not sure if you would laugh with me at Chicken Little, or oil, or ice ages, or acid rain, or ozone layers, or the disappearance of ice caps, or hiding under a desk to somehow shield yourself from nuclear fallout. But in some ways, all of us struggle with these things. In fact, you would even say in the last five years, there's been dips on all sides struggling with the end being near, some thinking there was this conspiracy to wipe out all of the population, others so concerned about what was going on that the population will be wiped out by what was happening. This fear or fighting that we have in our human nature, in our flesh, is sometimes even tickled up by the demonic realm, and we need to learn how to respond to life in the end times so that we bring honor and glory to Jesus, so that we stay unified and loving and honoring to Him. And we finished our study of the book of Revelation with that great longing, even so, Lord Jesus, come. And in the midst of that, we said, okay, if the end is near, if that's what the Bible actually teaches, how should we respond? And we've gone to 1 Peter chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, if you could open them with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, where literally this text tells us the end is near. This is not like an acorn falling on your head or conspiracy theories of the last hundred years or we maybe even could say of the last thousand years. This is actually reality. This is the God of the universe, the one who understands all things, telling us that the end is near. And so you need to respond in a way that he commands us to respond. Oh, don't get caught up in what is going on around us in the culture. Be aware, yes. Make sure you're honoring him, yes. But don't get so caught up in the culture that you miss what the Bible says. 
I want to read the text. We'll review where we've been. God willing, we'll spend one more week in this great passage. And today, we're literally going to jump off of it in terms of what it says is the most important thing if the end is near. And it is. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. This is a worldview, a perspective that dominates the Christian so we're not decimated by cultural shifts. For whoever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in their lives no longer in the flesh for human passions but for the will of God. If you underline verses in your Bible, that would be a good one to underline. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Here's verse 7, which has really been the linchpin of what we're trying to teach, the key. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And God's people said... Amen. See how radically God-centered this is? The end is near. Be dominated by seeking to bring him glory. The end is near. There's, there's nothing in here about fleeing or fighting. Or as we have said, panicking or punching. Got a number of emails last week just interacting with me. And okay, but there is things happening in our culture that don't honor God. And my answer is that is correct. And it's going to get worse as the return of our Savior approaches even more closely, we are in the end times. So how do we respond? And we said, first, we need to expect suffering. That's what this teaches. In fact, if you kept on going, there's this privilege of, of suffering for our faith, of standing firm in our faith. Listen, we need to understand this is because we represent Jesus. We're being holy and loving and humble in the world. And so the world says you're different than us and will accuse us of doing wrong. There'll be a, a suffering for Jesus. And the, the more the world drifts away from Judeo-Christian values and the more we truly are Christ-like, the more the world will see us as different. One of the pastors yesterday at our church's essential conference said, the world will see us as weird. And that is true. In fact, if you in your standing up on biblical issues in the culture find yourself aligning with many others that don't know Jesus, that is not what this is talking about. This is unique to being those men and women of, of faith. Be aware that we're different than the world. Be aware that when you are loyal to Jesus in the end times, those disloyal to Jesus will find you different and will persecute you. Then we said we need to be a people who are self-controlled, who are aware of what's going on around us because we want to be a people who pray, who, who actively depend on God, who are so God-besotted that we pray continually and we take special time together as a church family and individually to be people of prayer. We don't do this as well as we should because often either we don't think it's the end times or we think we can solve the problem by somehow engaging in the political or world around us in such a way that we almost take the place of God in our own abilities. We need to expect pain and suffering in a broken world. We need to be a people who stay sober-minded, self-controlled, passionate about Him so that we can pray. And then we discuss we need to be a people that is holy, that literally is set apart by God to serve Him and then lives in a way that is so radically different from the world that they are shocked that we don't join them in what they're doing. So holy that they can't understand why we choose to 
do what we do and not join them in what they're doing. Some have said one of the great mm, dangers of the end times, and certainly Jesus would affirm this, when I return, will I find faith in the world, is that the Canadian church has become much like the world. Aligning in groupthink wherever that groupthink takes them and then in that alignment not being who Jesus wants them to be. You saw in our text, there's a way of thinking, uh, an alignment with the Word of God, uh, Colossians 3, 17, word saturation, or Romans 12, 1 to 2, a, a rejection of how the world is training us to think on the internet or news or whatever the case may be, and aligning ourselves with the Word of God, this transformation of the renewal of our minds. We're saying we want to be so word saturated that this is where we start and stay in the presence of God and the power of the Spirit so that we, we think differently. And this allows us then to respond in the world, but not of the world in a way that glorifies God. Listen, groupthink is dangerous. We've seen that throughout history. Perhaps you've seen that in the last four or five years. There was a, a test conducted by a university, student, a university where uh, 10 students were placed in a room. And they had three lines of varying length. They were drawn on the, on the board, and the students were told to raise their hands when the instructor pointed to the longest line. Nine of the students had been instructed beforehand, they were kind of in on this study, that when they pointed to the shorter line, they were to all raise their hands. And one student who was not in on it, then they would watch and see their response to the crowd, the group, the group think in terms of them choosing the wrong line, and obviously the wrong line. And what they discovered, and they've done other studies since that even show this is more the case now in our current culture, is that 75% of the time, the student who was not in on the study would raise their hands with the other students. Listen, we need to be aware of this because the world is seeking to dominate our worldview. The demonic realm would love to shift us off of what the Bible teaches, and our own flesh is so selfish and desires self-rights and self-pleasing, that this is a problem that we need to actually fight against. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourselves in sober-mindedness. Be, be there in such a way that you are self-controlled and living for the glory of God, so radically God-besotted that the falling of acorns or crying of crisis leaves you privileged to please the king and bring him honor, not panicking or punching with the culture. Okay, pastor, obviously what you are saying is in this text. Now, now how do we apply that? And today we're going to focus in on verse 8 and then explode from verse 8 into the entire Bible for really this is a theme of the Bible, at least in terms of Jesus' teaching. He would even say this is the defining mark of true believers. If you want to know whether you're a believer or not, this, this John chapter 13 is the defining mark. This is how the world will know you're truly authentic in your faith. In fact, Jesus, when he summed up the entire Old Testament, said there's two commands that stand above them all, an all-consuming passion, a, a driving and defining of relationship of love with, with God, but also, second, a love for one another. So if the end is near and the Bible teaches it is, there is an above all statement. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Now on Labor Day every year we preach a sermon on the above alls of the Bible. And this one actually we preached on fairly recently. And so what I would like us to do is understand why it's here and then leave off of it to other passages to understand then how we can actually live this out practically in our lives. Because if this truly matters this much, in other words, if you, if you have any concerns that we're in the end times, if you have any concerns about what's going on in Canada or the world right now, if you, if you have any fears as you hear reports of all sorts of different things, then above all, this is what God wants you to do. Amen? I mean, it's there, it's in the text, it's, it's obvious, and yet so often we miss it because we're so distracted and we're not arming ourselves with this way of thinking. So what is it? The answer is, we are to be those who love one another. This is the priority of those who understand they're in the end times. Above all means, in the Greek, anybody help me out? 
above all. It's a priority. It's a supreme way of thinking and living. It's it's what we're to be and do as followers of, of Jesus. So this priority is perhaps obvious, and yet the demonic realm and the flesh and the world battle against it. If you want to look at some of the simple battles, at least that I'm very aware of, there are people who say, I'm not feeling loved, and make that their overwhelming focus. And when they feel that, feel sorry for themselves and don't actively look for people to love. Do you notice it doesn't say here, make sure you're loved. See, end times, make sure people are loving you, right? Wrong. It's saying because, and if we went to 1 John, which we will a little bit later in the pathway of getting here, it's saying this, listen, if if you experience the love of God and you're in the end times and everything's falling apart around you in terms of the culture and, and you know the culture is radically different than the Bible and what the Bible commands us to be, then above all, choose to love one another. Yes, corporate, but the individual demand means make this a priority in your life. There's a story told, I read it in a commentary about 150 years or so ago of two paddle boats that met in a river and they had left Memphis about the same time. They're traveling down the Mississippi River, they're going to New Orleans and as they're traveling side by side, the sailors started to go back and forth about who could win. Some even laughed and made a bed and a few made fun of the other about how slow they were going and As sometimes humans do, the rivalry grew and all of a sudden there was a little bit of angst and one boat crept ahead. The other caught it and went a little bit further ahead and then you could see back and forth yelling as they went this competition that was occurring and both captains now made it their deep passion to win the race to New Orleans. One boat was struggling because they didn't have as much fuel. There had been plenty for the trip but not for the race And so as they dropped back, there was one young sailor and he took some of the ship's cargo and he tossed it into the ovens and it burnt and they gained and threw some mar in and it burnt and they gained and the supplies as well. And finally, they were throwing everything into the fire so that they could win the race and they did. But when they arrived, they had burnt everything they were supposed to carry. See, I think sometimes when we lose sight of what the Bible teaches in terms of the end is near on our journey to glory, we get so caught up in other things, perhaps other priorities, perhaps they're even important, like winning a riverboat race, that we lose sight of what God has said is the above all priority. I want you to be encouraged and convicted. In fact, we'll come back to this and we'll say, well, how do we do this? Because we need to be practical in our application. Because we all know, John 13, this is what we're to be marked by. We, we all know we struggle with this and wish more people would love us in our flesh. And we, we all know the church needs to grow in this, even though I think our church does this fairly well. well. How do we do that? If this is the priority in the end times, we're in the end times, then how do we do that? So I've entitled the second place we'll stop, the pathway. We need to surrender to his lordship and experience his love. So this passage doesn't tell us how to get there, although I suppose if we carried on, we'd see some suffering and joining together in that suffering for God and the exclusivity of holiness and love for one another. But but how do we get there? And I'm, I'm so thankful that the Bible actually gives us two key ways to get there. I'm gonna walk you through them both. The first is in Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, which is a prayer. It's a prayer, and when you see the Holy Spirit inspiring a prayer, it teaches us not only what to pray and how to pray, but also in terms of its passion, what is on the heart of God. So we'll go to Ephesians 3, and we'll say, okay, we need to be a people who pray. And we also need to be a people who have experienced this love so richly that we imitate God. We, we pray that we'll experience the richness of the gospel, and then we pursue being like God, Ephesians 5, 1 to 2 is where we'll go for that. So let's look at the first, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. You can certainly turn there if you want because I hope that by now you have memorized this above all, love one another deeply for love covers a multitude of sins. Now the, the pathway to get there, and I, I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible because we don't have the time to work through this passage and the richness of it. 
But to get there, you need to know the love of God and and you need to experience the love of God. This prayer in Ephesians 3 is, is so profound because there's an idea here that if we experience the love of God, if the cross is central to our lives, then we'll be filled, this is what this text says, to the fullness of God. Will be like God. So what's the pathway in the end times to actually being able to say, I will choose to love no matter what is going on around me, no matter how chaotic the world is, no matter how unloved I feel, I will choose to love. Well, what's the pathway to that? And the answer is to experience the gospel richly. Now, there's some debate as to how high and wide and deep is the love of God. I actually think with some scholars, it's, it's talking about the love in specific ways. His love will hold you. His love is beyond anything you could imagine. And the height of that is seen in what Jesus did for us on the cross. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is so rich and so profound that if we can understand this, if we can experience it, then we will overflow with love. It won't It won't just be something we choose to do, although we must choose to do it. It will be who we are, literally our identity. So if you were to ask me, Pastor, why is it that in Canada, as Christians, we're known more for the way we punch or panic than we are for the way we pour our lives into others? My answer would be because we haven't experienced the love of Jesus like he wants us to. We know about it we haven't experienced it. I was teaching a little bit on this yesterday and I made a joke and no one laughed, which is fairly typical, so I'm going to set you up for it. This is meant to be a joke. As a, thank you, that was very, what a great congregate, what loving interaction with me, thank you. So if if you know, is any of you watching the playoffs right now, the Stanley Cup Finals? And, and we see the Florida Panthers losing, and they're losing to the Vegas Golden Nuts. Nuts. Knights. Nuts, yeah, I suppose. L- listen, I-, I would love to be able to cheer for one of my teams in the Stanley Cup Finals. I would love, now as a Calgary Flames fan, I've actually seen them win. Experienced it. Went out on the highways and honked my horn and yelled loudly. Actually, I was driving my cousin's vehicle, but same diff. We were screaming and yelling. The whole town exploded. Now, as a Canucks fan, I've never experienced that. In fact, we riot when we lose. Listen, there is something to knowing about the gospel, and we need to know about the gospel. We need to know about the love of God. We need to understand it with our minds. But if we want to love above all the way that 1 Peter 4 is commanding and demanding, if we want to have this that covers a multitude of sins, we have to experience it. It has to be real to us. It has to be the most real to us. The forgiveness, the freedom, the joy, the love of God that just overwhelms us. Because the only way to love this way is to love because he first loved us. If we don't experience his love, if we just know about it, then we'll panic or punch. We'll divide and destroy. We'll be selfish and sensual. Brothers and sisters, this pathway to this kind of love, so clearly in the Bible, is a pathway of experience. 1 John 4 makes this profound as well. I would have loved to spend more time in Ephesians 3. 1 John 4, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In other words, we experience this love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins, to pay the penalty in full to the Father, to satisfy the wrath of God Father, Son, Holy Spirit, fully. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. See, if you struggle with choosing to love and you're panicking or punching, the pathway must start and stay with experiencing the love of God. I said on this pathway there was two steps we would take. Experiencing the love of God. The second step, obeying the command of God. 
Ephesians 3 is followed by Ephesians 4. I love Ephesians 4, this worthy walk, this understanding of the greatness of God and seeking to align my life with his and walking in light of who he is and and being gentle and humble and engaged with one another. It's, It's powerful for a local church. And then using my gifts in the church so that we'll all be mature in this this whole concept of living this experience of God's love out in my life. And then five, one to two, I'm to be an imitator of God. An imitator of God. What does that mean? Well, it means a whole lot. But in Ephesians 5, one to two, what it means is that I live a life of love. So here's the experience. God loves me. I want to know it more. I want to be filled to the fullness of God. I want to experience the richness of the gospel so much that it just overflows. And then I want to be like God. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as God loved us. So you experience and you obey. You experience and you obey. And now you're saying with eager anticipation as you gather with the people of God, how do I love you? How can my humility be on display? How how do I show you the love of Jesus today? And we need this because the end is near. The end is near. Oh, not like chicken little or oil crisis or global cooling or warming or nuclear disaster, and I'm not trying to diminish any of those. I think we need to be aware of what's going on around us, but much more important, we need to be word-saturated so that we respond biblically to what the Bible teaches and to apply it to our lives. So we need to experience the love of God. We need to obey the command of God in terms of his lordship, to be like him. And then we need to make choices every day, and this is what I would just call implications. And these are personal and corporate, so please please hear this, because often the Bible is teaching us in community, the community of a local church. But there's an individual application we must make if we want to become what the Bible is calling us to become. If we want to be known as Christians for our love, not our anger, our angst, or our compromise, if we want to avoid being Pharisees or Sadducees or zealots or tax collectors or hiding away in Masada, if we, if we want to be those who truly are filled with the Spirit and inflamed for Him, then corporately we must do this. But the only way to corporately do this is individually respond and then together respond and to hold one another accountable for this. So if we were to say, how do I apply this? What are the implications? My first is, I suppose, just obvious. Make it your priority. Or I suppose, make it our priority to love one another. And if you want to know how much the Holy Spirit wants this to be a priority, then just look at his words. Above all, above all your other concerns and panics and fears and angers and angsts and everything else that's going on in this messed up, broken, chaotic world, above all of those things, the end is near. Love one another. Choose to love. Well, you say, how do I do this? Well, Ephesians 4 helps us be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven us. Or if you want to take our text, it overflows. It says, it covers a multitude of sins. Now, all of a sudden, I'm not concerned about what you've done to me. I'm concerned about how I can love you. There's a forgiveness and a freedom and a choice in the flow of the Spirit to to obey. See, the only way we'll be known for our love is if we've experienced the love of God and then choose to make this a passionate priority, choose to be kind, choose, in our text, overflowing, to be hospitable. Now, sometimes in our culture, we don't understand that word, and we think it just means to open our homes, and I think opening your homes are, it's a good idea. I don't think that's what it's saying here. Here, it's an open love of strangers. You probably have heard this before, but they didn't have hotels the way we have hotels. When people travel, there's a danger to staying outside or a danger of not finding a place. And basically, it was saying, open your life to others. It's more than opening your home, perhaps not less, although I wouldn't make that the priority. It's opening your heart. It's this risk of being willing to take, take your life in such a way that you're, 
you're okay with being taken advantage of by others. It's going to happen if you choose to love. Not everybody's going to love the way you love or the way you want to be loved. Not everyone has experienced the love of God, and so they won't be able to love selflessly like you or you're choosing to move towards. Let's together say, individually say, both corporately and individually, I will make it my priority to, above all, love one another deeply. Okay, if we make it our priority and we're making little choices and big choices to accomplish this, then what else can we do? And I would say this, let's, let's get on a path to make our lives obedient to this. Let's have our group think when anybody ever panics or punches around us to point back to this text. Let's be in the world but not of the world. Let's suffer with joy. Let's be those who are holy and loving and living our lives to the glory of our King. Let's pray that we would experience the love of God, that those around us, that this congregation would experience the love of God. Let's, let's pray that we experience it so richly that as 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, it compels us or, or literally squeezes us out. So this is just who we are. We, we become this transformed women and men who honor and glorify God. And then, then let's, let's reverberate with one another so that together we display this kind of love. The end is near. I suppose that's been seen in different ways throughout history as our introduction showed. There was a, a plague that hit Carthage in AD 252. It was serious enough that there were people who were dying and they discovered fairly early on that it was a contagious plague as plagues tend to be. And so when someone got sick or died, they would throw them outside of the city. They would get them as far away from others as they could to protect the city and for the greater good of the city. Obviously, this was difficult if someone you loved was sick and dead bodies were being disposed of and contaminated people thrown out. And so the bishop of Carthage at the time, a man by the name of Cyprian, called the church together. And he said to them, let's go live among the sick and dying. Let's give up our comfort and security and our own well-being and our own health to show these people the love of Jesus. Let's, let's be love to the rejected and forgotten. And I would love to tell you that when they did this, they didn't get sick and they didn't die. There was this miracle of the power of God. But they did get sick. And they did die. But here's the miracle of the power of love on display. The people they ministered to, some of them lived. And they saw in the love and self-sacrificial choosing of pain for ourselves and service of others, the love of Jesus. And there was literally a renewal of devotion to God and an experience of his grace. And I don't know if you've ever contemplated this, but the greatest miracle in the Bible or in our own generation, is where someone who is an object of God's wrath becomes a treasure of his grace. And amazingly, God has chosen us to complete his love by choosing in the end times to above all, love one another deeply. I hope and I pray that as you hear things happening from the news and as you read on the internet and maybe even talk with one another and as you struggle with whatever group think it is that you struggle with and you're picking lines that perhaps aren't as long as others as you echo chamber the news of the day, that you have the power to step back from that. The strength from God to step forward. And to choose, not to deny what is going on, but to go deeper with what is going on. Revelation taught us this, right? The end is near. How then should we live? Let's be prepared to suffer because we're in the world but not of the world. 
Let's passionately pursue holiness. Let's be so different from the world because we're set apart for good works because we're, we're displaying the wonder of someone who believes what the word of God teaches about morality and following Jesus. Let's be those who look at one another and say, how can I love you self-sacrificially? How can I be an imitator of God as a dearly loved child and live a life of love? How can I experience the love of God so richly that I just choose to love others? Every person here, I hope, is convicted by the word of God today. I mean all of us. If you're here and you don't know Jesus and it's showing in how you've responded to acorns hitting your head, then my pleading with you is today experience the love of God so richly that you choose to love, not panic or punch. If you're here and you're struggling forward and you're saying in your own heart and mind, I want to do this, I want to be one who lives my life in such a way that others see the love of God in me, then in the power of the Spirit today, I hope in the conviction and freedom that comes from a life in the Spirit, you will choose to live a life of love. Because if we do that, Not only will we be known for our love, as John 13 says, will happen to those who are authentic, but God will use us to complete his love, to reach the community that needs him so badly, and to help us stand firm, let nothing move us, but always give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. What a privilege. What a pleasure. What a plan. And so distinct from the world that panics or punches. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And so often we fall short of what your Bible calls us to do and we get caught up in groupthink and panic or punch. Forgive us. Free us from what the world is demanding, the flesh desiring or the demonic distracting and cause us to be those who experience your love so richly that it dominates our thinking, our feeling, and our very lives. Father, would you help us please to know how high and wide and deep is the love of Jesus. May you give us strength to comprehend with all those who know you and are known by you the depth of this love and that we would have uh, an experience of it that surpasses knowledge so that we can be filled with all the fullness of God. Give us the strength to choose what is right, the courage to reject what is wrong, and the delight to be able to do that together in a way that glorifies your holy and splendorous name. Thank you, Jesus. We need your strength to do this. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.